I'll turn it over to the two of them. All right, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good to be here with everybody. Eve, good to be here with you. <laughs> so our plan tonight is um, I'll kick off the evening with um, our sit, and then Eve and I will volley back and forth, and then she will conclude with a closing meditation too. So we get to practice a lot tonight. Our theme is um, loving kindness and primarily compassion. So this is, you know, really the bedrock and the heart of the mandala of all of our work, really. So we're, we're digging in and, and chewing on it and digesting it even more tonight. So I thought what I would do <clears throat> is for a meditation, excuse me, <clears throat> tonight is actually guide you through Dilgo Kense's guided meditation on compassion that's in this chapter. Chapter seven is our chapter tonight. And so essentially, for the most part, I'll be reading his words, which is a, is a great honor to be able to do that and share with you. One of the greatest Dzogchen masters of probably all time, but definitely of the 20th century, uh, and Matthew Ricard's primary root teacher as well. So he is a very important figure. I know Eve has spoken a lot about him as well. A beloved teacher. He was really the Dzogchen teacher, one of, one of the main Dzogchen teachers for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So he was a senior teacher to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Dilgo Kyanse Rinpoche. So that will be our meditation, will be compassion in his words in this classic Tibetan style, <clears throat> very similar to the Tonglen that we do in this class a lot. So let's go ahead and find a comfortable seat or even lying down in the supine position is a-okay. I welcome you to do that if the body needs that kind of support. Most important thing is to be comfortable, to have the spine in a nice straight uh, position, whether it's upright or horizontal. <clears throat> Just make sure you're not tilting off to one side. And uh, so now once you're feeling that you're in a position that you'll probably, you know, be able to hold with relative ease and stillness for about 30 minutes, then we can close the eyes and take some deep breaths and release any of the kind of residual tension, stagnation of the day with the out breath. I'll guide you through a practice of the nine relaxation breaths, which is a simple practice that we do often before feeding your demons as a way to drop in. So feeling the belly nice and soft, receptive to the breath. This is called a nine-fold relaxation breath. So with your next few breaths, breathe into any physical tension you may have in your body. Feel where you're holding physical tension in your body. Breathe into it and then release with the out breath. Feel that tension melting down into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension Feel where you may be holding emotional tension in your body. Breathe into it and then release with the out breath. Feeling it melting down, down into the earth beneath you like the rainwater. And then with your next few breaths, breathe in, do any mental tension. <clears throat> Feel where you may be holding worries or concerns in your body. Breathe into it and then release with the out breath, feeling that mental tension releasing and melting down into the earth beneath you.
Take a few breaths to feel your full global, visceral embodiment within the body from the crown of the head down to the soles of the feet to the perimeter of the skin. Just feel the mind embodying yourself here in this space, in your room, the temperature, the sounds, this kind of simple quality of being in this moment, in the body with the breath. We begin with our motivation. If you wish, you can take the bodhicitta mudra, the two fingers pointed straight up, the other fingers crossed, crisscrossed across each other, the thumbs parallel and upright, symbolizing the single pointed intention, the two middle fingers, to awaken for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Limitless is space. And Dilko Kensi says it's important to start by arousing this deeply felt warmth, the sensitivity and compassion for all beings before all of your sessions. You can release the hands down when you're ready. In this classical format of the compassion meditation as taught by Dilgo Kensei, he instructs us to begin by thinking about someone who has been very kind and loving to you. In most cases, this could be your own mother or someone who is like a mother to you. Remember and reflect on her kindness or their kindness, how they gave you life. If you are recalling your actual birth mother, recall how she suffered perhaps through the discomforts of pregnancy, the pain of childbirth, and how she looked after you as you grew up, sparing no effort. So even if your relationship with your mother was challenged, and even if you don't know your birth mother, we can even imagine this phase bringing you into the world. It's not so easy. And in that way, your birth mother made sacrifices for you to put your welfare before her own. And when you feel strong love and compassion Imagine that she or this person who was loving to you like a mother to you, whoever it is that you're picturing now. Imagine, I'll say she, just as for convenience, that she is undergoing terrible sufferings, that she suffers in agony before your very eyes. Perhaps she's no longer uh, living, 
but you can still imagine this metaphorical mother figure who may have in various ways experienced sufferings like versions of the hell realms, like being dragged along the ground or tortured. Perhaps she's starving, just skin and bones. Perhaps she's stretching her hands out to you, imploring you, oh, my child, do you have anything you can give me to eat? Imagine her reborn as an animal, a terrified doe, for example, being chased by hunters and their dogs. In panic, she leaps off a high cliff to escape them, but falls with unbearable pain, shattering all her bones, still alive, but unable to move. She is finished off by the hunter's knives. Continue to imagine your own mother or mother figure, another person that you have taken as the object of your meditation, undergoing situation after situation of suffering. An intense feeling of compassion will irresistibly well up in your mind. And at that moment, turn that intense compassion that you feel for that one person to all beings, realizing that each one of them must surely have been your mother many times and deserves the same love and compassion as your mother of this present life. Through countless lifetimes, it's said that we've all been each other's mother at one point or another. Extending this compassion to all beings, your mother. Especially it is important to include all those whom you now consider to be enemies or troublemakers. So we'll spend some time in silence here. Really let the mind roam. The different people or beings in your life or you know or know of and extend this compassion to them. Reflect deeply about everything that all these beings are going through as they wander endlessly in samsara's vicious cycle of suffering. Think about old, infirm people unable to care for themselves.
Think about all those who are sick and in pain, extending your compassion to them. People who are desperate and impoverished, lacking even the most basic necessities. People suffering famine, starvation, the pangs of hunger and thirst. Those who are spiritually destitute, starved of the nourishment of dharma and blind to any authentic vision of truth. Think of all those who suffer as slaves to their own minds constantly maddened by desire and aggression and about those who harm one another without respite. I visualize all these sentient beings as a crowd in front of you and let all the different forms that their suffering take arise vividly in your mind. And with an intense feeling of compassion, begin the practice of exchanging self and other. Think of all those who suffer and consider that as your breath goes out, all your happiness, all your vitality, your merit, good fortune, health, enjoyment is carried out to them on your breath in the form of a cool, soothing, luminous white nectar. Make the following prayer as you breathe and with each out breath, feel the soothing nectar flowing to them. And on the prayer, may this truly go to my enemy and be entirely given to them. And visualize that they absorb this white nectar. All these beings, especially our so-called enemies. And this nectar provides them with everything that they need. If their lives were to be short, imagine that now they are prolonged. If they need money, imagine that now they are wealthy. If they are sick, that now they are cured. And if they were unhappy, now imagine them so full of joy that they feel like singing and dancing. And then as you breathe in, consider that you take into yourself in the form of a dark mass, all the sickness, obscurations, and mental poisons of others and that they are thereby completely relieved of all of their afflictions. Think that their sufferings come to you as easily as mountain mist wafted away by the wind. And as you take their suffering into you, you feel great joy and bliss, 
mingled with the experience of emptiness, shunyata. Repeat this again and again until it becomes second nature to you. might also sometimes visualize that your heart is a brilliant ball of light. And as you breathe out, it radiates rays of white light in all directions, carrying your happiness to all beings. And then as you breathe in, their suffering, negativity, and afflictions come toward you in the form of dense black light, which is absorbed into your heart and disappears in its brilliant white light without a trace, relieving all beings of their pain and sorrow. Stay with that for a while. Sometimes visualize yourself transformed into a wish-fulfilling jewel, radiant and blue like a sapphire, a little larger than your own body, on top of a victory banner. And the jewel effortlessly fulfills the needs and aspirations of whoever addresses a prayer to it.
sometimes visualize that your body multiplies into infinite forms of yourself which travel throughout the universe, immediately taking on all the sufferings of each and every being they encounter and giving away all your happiness to them. Sometimes visualize that your body transforms into clothes for all those who are cold and needing clothing, into food for all those who are hungry, and into shelter for all who are homeless. Wow, the spirit of the, the great Pema Chodron, let's pan back all the way now up into outer space and sitting atop the moon. Imagine that you're gazing down upon planet Earth from the vantage point of the moon. And in the same vein with the heart luminous like the sun breathing out all that is good and joyful and healing and breathe in all that is afflicted and painful, working with the light, working with the breath, breathing out that white nectar surrounding, encompassing the world and all the beings in it and even beyond into the universe. And then with the in-breath, breathing in the vapor, like smoke, drawing it into the heart space, mingling it with bliss and emptiness. And breathing out that healing nectar. Wishing that all beings everywhere be free of suffering and free of the deep, deep roots of suffering. And may they experience happiness and the deep, deep roots of happiness. Releasing the visualization and just breathe for a few moments, feeling the body again in space, in your room. Feeling the breath rise and fall within the body. This quality of being, presence.
That is none other than your own rigpa, your own awareness. We'll conclude with a dedication of merit for the benefit of all beings, like a drop of water releasing into the vast ocean of positive energy. Our merit is like that drop of water releasing, we let go, and it becomes infinite, as vast as the ocean. For the welfare of all beings, we practice. Come back, opening your eyes if they were closed, and feel your, yourself blending the meditative state with the post meditative state. <laughs> we can open it up if anybody has questions, observations. This was quite a psychedelic ride, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, when I each time I read this or visualizations or meditations like this i think well with this one in particular i could picture dilgo kense sitting in his mountain cave which he I believe he spent a total of 12 years in a cave you know it can get pretty psychedelic <laughs> up there pretty creative and uh colorful i mean the 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 boundless imagination is free to roam in those types of deep spaces. I see Jason has a hand raised. Your hand is really all that I can see. <laughs> you got like this ghost hand. <laughs> Go I'm ahead, enjoying, Jason. I'm enjoying the solstice darkness, and uh, it's it's quite nice, really. Um, but the um, you know the the thing that occurred to me during this particular one was when I was imagining my mother falling off of a cliff and breaking all of her bones. I mean, that, that image was so, it kind of woke me up, you know, or something. There was something so radical about it. Um, and I, it didn't, I was just like kind of um, taking a ride on that. It kind of caught me by surprise how much uh, it, it just sort of brought me to a certain kind of thought about, wow, you know, that's quite an image, you know, that it didn't occur to me that we were going there and then we were there. So uh, it kind of opened a door or something. Uh, but I also wanted to say that I, I, I had an experience where um, my mother was hiking and fell off a trail and she rolled down a hill in Berkeley, just above the track and in, in the Dwight sort of Piedmont area. And um, I wasn't there to help her. I was, I was far away and she had to be helped by, there was supposedly a homeless guy there who was engaging with her and, and call, he somehow facilitated calling a cop and they brought in the ambulance and they had to go down this rugged terrain. To get, and I just, that's the image I have. So I have this image of her falling. She broke her ankle and she had to get surgery and then I helped her recover. So I had that, I have a very direct relationship with this that that is sort of rekindled and I appreciate it, but it was so completely um, just intense. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you in the Sangha that um, I have found out recently that my father has uh, lung cancer. So I'm really working through his imminent passing and it's not altogether tragic. It's just really intense. So I'm, I'm kind of like working with that level of mother, father, um stuff so this really this really struck a chord i just wanted to say that so uh, other than that I, I just wanted to thank you for taking us there and happy holidays jason thank you for all of that yeah that's quite phenomenal that you had such an intimate 
firsthand experience of mom. Yeah, that was that was quite a, a ride. Thank you for sharing. And I'm sorry to hear about your father too. Good luck with everything. And I hope I hope that you have the support and he has the support that he needs. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's what, what I said. It's like I'm reading his words, you know. I mean, I have, for, as a Western teacher, I tend to want to like soften things or tone things down a little bit. So it, it was kind of fun to take you off the cliff in that sense of, okay, I don't know how this is going to land for people, but this is the authentic. This is the tradition. This is what catalyzes our hearts into, yeah, the waking up from the slumber sometimes or the humdrum. Oh, yeah, here we go. Compassion again. <laughs> Uh, it can be jarring, it can be unsettling, but it can also, like Jason so beautifully said, it can it can kind of sh shake you awake into a new space that then you can work with that energy and to help that transform the mind and the heart. Yeah, thank you. Chandra, that was, um, yeah, an unbelievable practice. I felt like I was in the cave also. Did uh, you? Yeah, really, really potent. And um, just two things I want to highlight. Um, I just can't imagine having done that practice without the Sangha. Um, there's something about even in our virtual space to be able to be together and hold an, we, each other. Um, I was tempted a couple times even to open my eyes to reassure myself you were all here. So that just was, it was so beautiful um, to know that that presence is here. And Jason, I really appreciate you. Yeah, utilizing that with us and sharing with us. Because um, there is such a power um, in doing these visualizations together. And, and one thing I want to mention, we, we talked a little bit about this, uh, this week, but it, it comes up every time um, I teach compassion and Chandra, I imagine the same for you is this uh, misunderstanding or confusion or, or interest in the relationship of compassion and empathy. And I think what's interesting, um, you know, what Jason shared with us is the empathy for him was, could be in some ways instant because it was so familiar. And so often, you know, of course, the purpose of this practice is using what's familiar, what we easily can have this empathy. I could imagine that, right? I could imagine that, wow. And then, you know, kind of boosting it all out to, many, many different uh, realms. And with, <clears throat> with empathy, it's, it's interesting one way that, um, especially, you know, we look at it in, in psychological science is our susceptibility to fantasy. It sounds very unscientific, but it means if we're reading a book, if we're watching a movie, how porous are we to get caught up in the narrative? And that that's actually one way we can understand empathy. And you know, you, you say your <clears throat> hesitation um, to lead a practice like this, and yeah, I share it. And yet, you know, I, I, won't, I won't make anybody self-confess, but who has seen something worse in a movie or television program this week, mm -hmm. right? We are exposing ourselves to the visual imprint so often uh, of these really difficult experiences. So we can think of this as, once again, you know, our little meditation laboratory where we're kind of stirring that pot of empathy so that we can generate compassion and not, you know, I, I know for myself when I'm watching a program where there's um, aggression or violence, I think my shoulders are literally at the tops of my ears for the whole time. Like that's not the stance of compassion, right? Um, that's just not. So uh, yeah, so I think there's just a real richness of evoking that care with this imagined difficulty. Um, so yeah, and, and one more thing I'll just offer to Jason. Um, yeah, happy, happy to chat maybe um, in another session, we can talk a little bit about bringing compassion to death and dying and, and those that we love as, as you know, they are dying. I definitely thought of my mom and being with her as she died. Um, and she did kind of have a little bit of that described experience and the compassion that arises is profound. It's of course, there's a other things in there, but I, I, uh, I think it's such a wonderful um, and deliberate way to use these teachings for in a lot of ways, what they're meant for, for us to help. So yeah, thank you Chandra for that practice. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how people um, felt those other options at the end, too. But sometimes you may want to imagine yourself as a wish-fulfilling jewel, mm. emerald color, no, sapphire, on a victory banner, fulfilling everything that people pray for. I mean, how, you know, or that your body multiplies and is able to just do infinite bodhisattva activities. <laughs> really like the, the, there's no limit to what the imagination can do and i'm just curious maybe if anybody wants to chat it in or unmute and just share um yeah david and leanne then. I, lo I loved the turning into the wish fulfilling jewel and then becoming all these different me's going out or sitting on the moon and it was so creative i was um both in the you know in the meditation uh really doing it but then also some part of small watcher part of me was just like wow this guy is so creative <laughs> and really getting into like that um connection and the, the feeling and the heart feeling was powerful and fun too great yeah, thank you for sharing, David. I'm glad you enjoyed. Yeah, and to be the watcher, to be in the experience, but also to be watching the enjoyment or the wow of it. Like, oh, this is cool. That's a beautiful faculty to have. Leah, I think there was one, and then and then she disappeared. Do you want to yeah, come back? I'm here. There um, you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's my 35th birthday at the stroke of midnight, which is in 40 minutes here on the East Coast. Um, and I've been looking forward to this meditation all week. And today, especially, I had just, you know, was like feeling out of sorts. I'm, you know, working a lot and was just like, okay, I can't like, this is going to be, it. I'm going to like meditate. It's going to be the transition. It's going to be great. Then you hit me with my mom falling off my <laughs> and I was like, no, like very resistant. It was like, because I sort of was for myself coming to this practice today, just, you know, wanting to like feel good and to self-soothe. And so it took me a good like half of the practice to, and that, and I at first, and I even was like, it's your birthday, do it, like just mute her and go do your meditation. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but you know, I thought work, you know, like work with what's here. And um, it was finally getting to, and I, I've remembered other conversations we've had around this practice too, where, because my experience was just, it wasn't even one of compassion. It was just one of despair. Mm -hmm. Like it was just like, oh God, it was one of horror. And um at some point I was able to actually, I think perhaps with the white light, like really just settle into the feeling of the radiation and the cycle of, of just what I'm breathing out and breathing in. And it finally kind of shifted to, I don't know about joyful, but um, mm. like an empowered, or like my experience of myself suddenly became exactly what I would like to carry into the new year in terms of what I'm able to radiate and like being able to sort of sit in a center of power. And I know what's always resonated for me about this practice is how it makes, it gives you some sense of agency over suffering that you otherwise feel that you have no power over, so. I just wanted to share because it was <laughs> like a really good, that, that was my experience with the practice. And in, in the end, it was useful. <laughs> Glad you shared. I'm sure you're not the only one. I, it's to be expected. <laughs> but that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And awake birthday to you, or as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, happy continuation day, because there is no birth and no death on the ultimate dimension. <laughs> and then of course i have to sing this is your birthday song it won't be very long hey <laughs> i'm trying to replace the old tired birthday song with that one
much more efficient. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on your birthday. Okay. Wonderful. Eve, do you want to take it away? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, I want to say again, I'm, I'm really feeling the um, appreciation for Sangha tonight and um, seeing some familiar faces I haven't seen in a while and faces I see more often. And yeah, just so appreciating you all here just the day after solstice and um, kind of coming together and supporting each other and practice so beautiful. Um, and, you know, the, the prospect of being together in person is almost overwhelming um, and very exciting. So thanks, Karen, um, for sharing that with us and Noam and yeah, the whole community for rallying together. Um, we will, of course, continue online um, and make sure that experience is supportive. That's one of our great uh, benefits of this time of separation is learning how to do that well. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to bring us to uh, a couple verses here that begin on page 87. This is from the great master Atisha. And a couple of these phrases, you know, it's so interesting all of the teachings necessarily have to be illustrative, right? At kind of pointing the fingers at the moon as opposed to being the moon. And yet sometimes some words, it just creates such a rich feeling that it's almost like we get the teaching. It's almost like it can come into our heart mind and really open up and illuminate. And these phrases have a little bit of that quality. So now that I've totally built up your expectations, Let's hope they are some approximation. Sun, all things of samsara and nirvana arise from mind in itself, in which no one has ever seen the least cause or condition. On examination, the mind is seen to be like a rainbow in the sky. Know that emptiness and compassion are like the sky and the rainbow. Sun, see everything like waves in motion that ruffle the surface of the deep ocean. They arise from the ocean itself and sink back into the ocean. Nobody has ever seen the least demarcation between the moving waves and the depth of the ocean. Likewise, compassion for beings immersed in illusion arises spontaneously out of emptiness. It springs forth from emptiness and to emptiness it returns. Really lovely, um, yeah, visualizations, especially the rainbow. Uh, for me, you know, what an incredible phenomena that we get to experience um, through, through our vision. I haven't gotten to see a rainbow this rainy season quite yet, but I remain hopeful. And this something that can be so radiant, so powerful, just so moving, like compassion, like a rainbow, you know, also has this quality of kind of, um, yeah, not having form, not having a fixed place. And <clears throat> that piece of it, it, it just has such a sense for me, something so beautiful that an experience um, as, of compassion that it includes or necessarily, as it says here, arises spontaneously out of emptiness. So we kind of ended last week in this part of the chapter on what does this mean, <clears throat> this idea of emptiness in relation to our compassion? And especially, I, I, gave, I gave this group some homework. I actually heard from one of our Sangha members offline. How can we describe emptiness in a secular way? What is, how can we make sense of it um, in a way that's relatable to all beings, um, irrespective of their, their desire for this kind of poetry or their feeling or direct experience of emptiness? And one thing I, I was um, really feeling and pulling from this chapter is this idea that our, our compassion here should be evoked, as it says, just spontaneously, spontaneously and unconditioned. Those two qualities just feel so unbelievably essential. So <clears throat> when we think of it being spontaneous, it means it's not as though, okay, I see someone suffering, okay, right, I'm supposed to feel compassion and care. And again, something I mentioned last week is we know that we are hardwired to care for each other, that that's part of 
of what's encoded in us for the survival of our species. It's not just a kind idea. So to have some faith and confidence that our compassion could be spontaneous, that really gives it its own strength and power. And this idea that, you know, it is, it is for com all beings immersed in illusion. So Chandra kind of got us there as well. So it's not conditional onto, you know, our mother or someone who's treated us nicely, but for all beings immersed in illusion. It's a really pithy way of kind of calling out everyone. That includes our enemies, that includes our friends. And one thing that we will look at in the next passage by His Holiness the Dalai Lama is so much of suffering is mental suffering. So much of our suffering that we want to help people with in terms of extending compassion and so much of our own suffering comes from this being caught, this immersion and illusion of how things are. So it's really interesting. Can you imagine looking at a rainbow and, and thinking it was a painting in the sky, trying to like grasp it, hold on to it? Right? Maybe a child would do that, but as adults, we could never imagine that. Nor would we try to kind of catch a wave and prevent it from going back into the ocean. So this sense of fluidity, this sense of, again, kind of permeated by change, by shifting, just feels very rich. It gives me a, such a sense feel for this passage and how we can start to experience compassion for ourselves and others. Chandra, I'd love to hear if you had any thoughts on this beautiful passage as well. Okay. So <clears throat> the next one I want to share, the next part I want to share here, I just mentioned it. So we're on page 88 now. It's so, hey, it's just such a, <laughs> this, this couple pages by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, it is so practical, so usable, such like truly a tiny little guide it's almost um, as though he took an entire chapter out of Beyond Religion and just kind of shrunk it into some pages that are like, oh, you want to learn compassion? Okay, let's do this. So he, he really starts off by giving us um, the kind of bare bones and the basics. And one, one thing he says on page 88 here is that for most of us, it is the mind that plays the most decisive roles in feelings of well-being and ill-being. In comparison, the role of our physical condition is secondary, unless we are seriously ill or in abject poverty. However, the mind can be affected by the most insignificant events. So it's appropriate to make more effort to pacify the mind to ensure one's physical comforts. So he's kind of building up this case of, okay, if I want to have compassion for all beings, and we know how many beings are starving and how many beings are sick, why am I working on my mind? Like what? How does that make sense? You said compassion, right? Shouldn't I do something? So just this beautiful little series of lines to remind us that if we care about compassion, we start here training the mind, training the heart mind. And then if we care about helping others, just the same, we care for their minds and hearts. That's what we want to offer. <clears throat> of course, that will not help them out of abject poverty, will not help them if they are experiencing life-threatening illness, and yet for the majority of people, this holds true. And then he gives us this wonderful encouragement. It's possible to transform our minds. Of course, that's why we're all here. That's why we come here and are not watching a uh, some sort of um, kind of Christmas holiday movie or something like that of those sorts. Maybe we can do so later. And he says that the way that we cultivate compassion is really using our everyday life. We don't kind of have to go outwards and, and look for training somewhere else. Uh, Matthieu Ricard um, sometimes talked about this idea of a gymnasium of compassion, a place where people could kind of come and, you know, strengthen and like work their compassion. So it's not as though our compassion, though we have this intrinsic capacity for it, no matter what, no matter who we are, no matter what we have done or not done, it still needs strengthening. It's part of this process of cultivating our mind. And as His Holiness says, 
To cultivate compassion, it is not enough to believe in its benefits or to marvel at the beauty of such feelings. We have to make an effort and use all the circumstances of daily life to change our thoughts and behaviors. And I love, you know, kind of tying that back into this idea that even the smallest thing, even that little grain of sand, like it in the oyster shell can be so agitating, can be so upsetting to us. And that unless we, you know, can coat it in some, something like compassion, gives us no peace. I think, you know, there's so many uh, examples of this, you know, on a day to day basis, can we have compassion for even the small things, even the small things, it was a uh, very busy uh, in the world today, I had to run an errand. And um, everyone is understandably very concerned about the new variant that's going around. And so there was a, you know, kind of a lot of bracing and someone uh, in line where I was getting, um, getting some groceries, just like went by and totally bumped me and three people in a row. Um, because they were so caught up trying to be six feet away from another person who was on the other side of the aisle. And there was, you know, a feeling of fear and being trespassed upon and, you know, all of these disturbances of the mind. And in that instant, right, there's an opportunity to wish compassion for all of us who are afraid. All of us who are really worried, all of us who are tired, tired of this. Or get really frustrated and maybe let that frustration kind of follow this person who had jostled us all and maybe follow me as I'm going and uh, paying for my items. So it's, you know, it's a real discipline to actually make every single thing we do part of this practice. And one last thing I'll, I'll share from this passage um, is that the Dalai Lama really encourages us to say, whether others are beautiful or ugly, benevolent or cruel, they are all sentient beings like us. And like us, they want to be happy and not suffer, which is their right, just like us. Recognizing that all beings are equal in their aspirations and their right to happiness, we feel a sense of empathy that brings us closer to them. As we get accustomed to this impartial altruism, we finally experience a sense of universal responsibility. And he ties this universal responsibility to our greatest sense of well being. And he gives us a very realistic kind of paraphrase around it, which is it won't really manifest in us until we can really release the grips of self centeredness. We can still try along the way. We shouldn't just wait until self centeredness is gone to have that sense of kind of universal responsibility and compassion to one another. But again, here we are setting out on our voyage, our lifelong journey of compassion, starting with our mind and heart. And wow, one of the first obstacles we face on this great journey is us, us in the way, right? And, and I, one simple way I think about this is, you know, we're like, well, but you know, how bad is it if I feel attached to myself? I mean, really, how does it get in the way of compassion? I'm just thinking of, you know, when we feel like I, let's say in this store, when, when we feel agitated or frustrated, wow, it is, it makes our compassion just shrivel up. So until our self-centeredness can be looser, that compassion can't flow irrespective of outside conditions. So his hope here, his aspiration for us is to have this universal responsibility, this unconditioned aspiration of compassion manifesting throughout everything we do. And yeah, if we're busy caught up in our own sticky thoughts and feelings, our grudges, our comparisons, compassion just doesn't get as much room as it deserves. So yeah, there's a bit more in here, but I want to take a pause there and see Chandra, if you have, if this lights anything up for you. Um, yeah, I think what you just said about the self-compassion, right? And that that is also the, the buffer, or the, you know, the, the lamb's wool that helps soften the blow of all of mm -hmm. this. 
And I think it was either him in the around here or in another passage. Yeah, where we talk, where do you start? Right? Did you is that what you were just talking about? Page ninety. Mm-hmm. That we must begin by addressing anger and hatred, which are yes. biggest obstacles to selfless love. But also, when I first read that line, I read it as the biggest obstacles to self love, <laughs> because that's really one of my big edges, you know. Um, yeah, so selfless love, but also self love. Mm. Uh, self, if we can be kind and compassionate to ourselves, then it's going to be easier to to feel that for other beings, and then. I would say also the other way around too. Um, I remember a good friend of mine said to me, and it really stuck with me, uh, was, Chandra, I hope that the same degree of love that you give others, that you can give to yourself. And I thought, wow, (laughs) she nailed it. (laughs) You know, for me, it's easier to be like, oh yeah, you're so great. And then when I turn the critic or, you know, the judgment to the self, it's pretty darn harsh, you know, often way more harsh than with other people. So um, I loved the image that you just brought up of the softness, the buffer, the, for me, Mm. felt like the lamb's wool, Mm. you know, uh, around the sharp edges that can be quite hurtful. And the compassion practice really does provide that. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> it's perfect timing, right? If, if folks here are going to be spending some time with family over the holidays mm-hmm. virtually or in person, it's a great time to practice compassion. He goes on in this chapter to talk about compassion for those who are most difficult for us. This amazing opportunity to exercise patience and to really, right? Again, if we're transforming everything in our life, whether it's you know in the grocery store or with family into an opportunity for compassion. Boy, do we need patience. I mean, we need we need so much humbling to really view the people who drive us absolutely insane as our greatest teachers and not do so in that kind of flippant way of, oh yeah, they're my teacher. Um, but truly like, wow, no, truly, that is, that is a teaching to me. Um, I definitely resonate with that teaching and, and certain um, family members and, and that feeling of being schooled, not always pleasant, but can we transform that experience of, of anger or protection into, into that very ground for transformation? It's, yeah, it's really rich. And I, I will say it's funny because in different places, um, as always the Dalai Lama talks about anger in different ways, depending on which scientists and philosophers he's talking to at the time. And I I definitely think that there is room for for the healthy experience and expression of anger. But that hatred, which connotes a sense of harm, a desire for harm, there's never a place for that, right? That is the destructive uh, quality he's talking about. Any folks have questions or comments on this first rich part of our reading tonight? Feel free to use the chat, raise your hand. <laughs> Is it true the statement here? He says, when you lose your temper, you close the access to the rational part of the brain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we can say, yeah. Pretty much. I mean, any, you it's know, and also when we feel fear. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it really is um, really hard for us to, to step out of that grip um, when we're deep in the emotional episode. And that reminds me of the, the whole tantric approach to the five poisons, which is not to cut them out or to do away with them in a, in a kind of a, you know, denial sort of way, which would be more of, one could say like the earlier ways of addressing emotions it taught in the earlier forms of Buddhism and other ascetic traditions or monastic traditions, but Tantra, which is more about life as path mm-hmm. and uh, taking all the joys and sorrows onto the path. So if we have anger in Tantric Buddhism, it talk, we talk about uh, the energy behind or within that anger is actually, you know, wisdom 
And in particular, anger gives rise to what's called mirror-like wisdom, a kind of very clear seeing, a cutting through Vajra, like a lightning bolt kind of cutting through. So instead of becoming blind, you know, so angry that we're blind in a way, it's like, could it, can our anger help us see more clearly, you mm. know, more bright and channel that? So then find that, uncover that and, and channel that. Mm. And I've worked with that, you know, I'm not saying like anger and impatience is what definitely, I'm definitely a Vajra type. So that's definitely my encumber pattern. And so um, I've worked with it and I do think that there's something to this. I can definitely, as my years, you know, as more years are behind me, I definitely feel that I have a, a greater capacity to transform the energy of anger into actually a clear seeing, like, mm. Okay, I need to say this right now. And mm. there's clarity behind that. It doesn't have to be angry and hateful, but it can be clear and concise and strong, you know? Yeah, and, and it can even, you know, as, as he um, says a little later in this passage, the clear seeing could be of where we're stuck as well, right? So That's maybe right. there is an action to make. He, he says um, to eliminate the destructive potential of anger and hatred. We must understand they are rooted in the pursuit of our own well-being to the detriment of others. This selfishness, not only the source of anger, it causes all of our troubles. And so I think, you know, the, the pivot on that or the bridge between what you're saying is the anger might have a really interesting signal it's sharing with us. It might be showing us and maybe it's a, a trespass of something we do need to address. And sometimes it's showing us wow, like where our ego is getting bruised, right? Where we don't feel seen or heard or appreciated. And it's about us. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing when we can kind of see it with kindness. And then the kindness just blossoms all around. I, I, I've experienced that kind of freedom from anger before, feeling hurt, feeling wronged, and then having this sense of, wow, you gosh, you're just you feel hurt you feel sad and these other people they're just kind of not really that relevant in your experience you know that's an old story and the kindness of that can then radiate outwards too so it can give you that clear seeing to avoid harm from others and, and clear seeing with our own um rootedness here uh, in our our patterns and desires to kind of parade around a, a, a vision of ourself we want everyone to get on board with. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about fear um, and anger. As you two were talking about fear and anger, <clears throat> I've always wondered, I don't think fear is one of the five uh, emotions that gets transformed in the Vajrayana. Um, but as Eve was talking, I, I remembered a psychologist telling me once that uh, underneath anger was fear, that somehow they were connected. So anything to say about those, those topics? Eve, I bet you'll have something to say, but in terms of the mandala, because I've done a lot of work with the mandala structure, right? And you've got the five afflictive emotions or the five poisons are placed in each of the quadrants of the mandala. And then, and where is fear? People always say, well, where is fear? <laughs> uh, and what Lama Tsultrum says is actually fear is underneath all of them. But if you were to put it into one of the families of the five Buddha family, you know, qualities, it would definitely be within the anger one. So there's a, you're right on it there with what the psychologist said to you as well is that's that's what the teachings say i don't know where the psychologist got that but it, it does make sense in a way that the fear well really the ultimate fear is the fear of death or the fear of separation and that because through that then then we split right and then we we, we either are ignorant of our true nature which is really the root poison which is in the center of the mandala and perhaps it even grows out into the east from there, into the Vajra family in the eastern dimension where there's anger because mm. we're so pissed off that we're split from the mother, right? <laughs> it's like, shit. Mm. And then to the right, then you could travel around in a clockwise direction around the whole mandala. And then you go arrogant pride, 
overcome to overcome or compensate for the anger and the, the split. And then if you went into the Western dimension of the Padma family, where desire is there, then perhaps you could connect the dots a bit with there. This like arrogant pride uh, giving way to a kind of grandiosity or a desire to fill the void, you know, needing to fill the void that the pride is trying to also hide. And then mm. if you go into the Northern dimension of the karma family, the, the Buddha family of the karma, Northern dimension, then that encumbered pattern is the um, jealousy, but it's actually like a competitiveness. And, mm. and so that you, you can at times translate this as an arc of evolution of like, okay, the mm -hmm. desire is coming out of a feeling of needing to fill the void or have pleasure or have the other outside validate and meet the needs for pleasure or for wholeness. And then if that's not met, then the jealousy and competitiveness, the workaholism, that kind of perpetual activity that's the northern dimension of the karma family action then manifests. But so underneath all of that can be that fear that arises from the split of the ground of being. Yeah. There's your mandala. That. I always try to get in the teaching on the mandala whenever I, I can. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, I think there's such a, you know, a wonderful, rich conversation around, you know, emotions and mental states. Um, so around these different ways that we experience um, day to day fluctuations. So when we think of fear, especially in this idea of um, kind of underlying this fear of separation or this desire, um, that is something that is, is an ongoing experience and definitely could be kind of uh, boiling underneath us on a day to day consciously and unconsciously. When we think of emotions, um, especially in the contemporary context, we're talking about almost like these little emergences, these little uh, tips of the icebergs arising up. It could last, many emotions last only 30 to 90 seconds. So those are really brief. And they can be, you know, for lack of a better word, pure anger. It doesn't have to be arising from fear or sadness. I would say sadness and fear um, and a desire to not experience those can definitely give way to anger as a kind of defense mechanism. But there is such thing as anger, anger, anger in its own right. So a feeling of frustration, the theme of that from an evolutionary perspective is of being blocked. So there is a belief that um, in our kind of evolutionary trajectory as emotions evolve to help us effectively work with the different experiences, opportunities, and threats in our environments, that it's likely that some, that fear came first, right? Getting away from the woolly mammoth, really important. But then anger came probably soon after. So when we look at the kind of automaticity and the rapidity at which we can be triggered to each, there's a sense that um, they, they are both primary or they're both very important. And there can be a quick rapid cycling between the two. We can feel a lot of anxiety and then we can feel really frustrated, feel really frustrated and then and then anxious. So there's a fluidity. And I think for the purposes you know, of, of the path, uh, I loved how Karen said, we're still on the path to enlightenment. I was like, yeah, we still are. Yes, <laughs> um, all probably for at least this lifetime. Um, you know, I, I think for the purposes of being on this path, the more granular we can get on these kind of underlying factors, and then on the momentary experiences, the better. Our emotions are invisible, they're intangible. Yes, they're in the body and we feel them, we kind of see them on the face, but the more we get curious, so I, I love the nature of your question because it, it invites us to be curious and dig deeper into our first person felt experience. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Chandra, do you want to tell the story? And I can just do a kind of very brief. Okay, you want me to do the meditation? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. better. Yeah, we've been talking for a while. I'd love to. Yeah. Time for so, um, well, let's 
Well, we can maybe send uh, Leanne a, a birthday message later and let her know that that soothing meditation that she was looking for is, is coming her way at the end of this practice. And we can hold, hold her in mind partially, because how sweet uh, to be with a Sangha member turning into a new continuation. I love that. <laughs> So for this practice, we're going to, in some ways, um, go to the very source of the well. How do we generate and feel a close connection to that sense of awakened heart? And we've done this practice before in the context of starting Tonglen, a way to really feel kind of grounded in our capacity for love and being loved. That will be our brief practice here. I'm trying to... um, See, I know that some of the meeting preferences changed and it can be harder to hear the bell. So I'm going to see if you guys, can you guys hear my bell? Wonderful. Okay, so let's go ahead and come back into our posture of dignity, our posture of openness, finding that long upright spine inviting a softness through the front of the body and a sense of being supported by the ground beneath us and supported in our virtual shared space together supported and held in these teachings And we'll take a couple moments here to connect with the rhythm of our breath. Wherever it's easy to notice your breath through the nostrils or the chest or the belly, invite your full attention to follow the inhale and exhale. And we'll gently shift now from the breath and body to our mind and imagination and memory. And we'll take a moment here to look back on our life. And imagine all the love we have received in this life, maybe starting with that mother or mother figure all the beings we have known and received kindness from, all the beings we have known and felt cared for, held in love. Some of those beings are still here with us, some are gone or lost along the way. And consider that this love we received throughout our entire life is here right now. Woven into our very presence, to our body, through our cells. Maybe certain images or faces come to mind. Take a couple moments here and really take in that sense of all the love which has been received and poured into this being, to this body, this heart. Feel the goodness and strength of that love. Mm 
And taking a moment here and considering, again, going back as far as you can recall and maybe even farther, of all the love you've extended in this life, those you've loved and cared for. Some of those beings are gone now. Some remain. Sometimes the heart has even been broken and yet it continues to love and love and love. Again, taking a couple moments here just to consider the vastness, the strength and power of all this love which has been generated, extended and shared with others. And allowing this love of the past to be right behind us. And now shifting our gaze to the future in front. Imagine all the love you will receive in the future from beings known and unknown. in the next month, in the next year, in the next decade, how many opportunities there may be to receive love and kindness, to be held in care. Invite that potential and feel the goodness of that, the strength of that in the body. And imagine all the love that will be extended in the future to beings known and unknown. Considering just that wondrous potential of new love over and over and over again, both receiving and extending into the future. And from this place of being held by the love of past and the love of future, both of which are present here now. From this place, consider the capacity of our own heart. Our heartfelt aspiration, desire to be of service, to awaken for the sake of all beings. Feel that aspiration coming from the strength of love given, love received. And from this strength, we dedicate the merit of our practice and time together this evening with an aspiration of compassion and loving kindness that all beings would know the causes of suffering and be free. That all beings would know the true causes of happiness and meet them. May all beings, seen and unseen, past, present and future, be free.
What a gift to be with you all, to be with you, Chandra. Yeah, really lovely. Thank you.